been a, a great uh, day so far uh, visiting the Bird uh, Polar Center, and it's uh, heard so much about it for many years. I've never been here before. Uh, now I know a lot more about it, and it's uh, a great place. Uh, so, um, how many were uh, might have been at the uh, Sigma Xi lecture last night? Okay, only a few. So. Uh, you're going to have to suffer through the first 60 slides. <laughs> but the good news is it takes less than three minutes to go through them. Because, uh, but uh, anyway, um, um, much of the rest of the talk is different. So my talk is, uh, several, has several points to it. Hurricanes, weather patterns, and climate change. Why a few degrees matter. And sometimes you hear uh, from people who say, uh, why should I care about uh, two or three degrees? Uh, Celsius uh, rise in climate and maybe 50 years from now when uh, uh, the day to night changes are much bigger than that and the seasonal changes are much bigger than that and if I fly from Miami to uh, Columbus the changes are much more, uh, bigger than that so why the heck should I care about two or three degrees <clears throat> and so um, uh, I wanted to try to at least give my perspective on why a few degrees uh, matters you can actually get at this from other perspectives too in areas that you all know much more about than I do, and that's paleoclimate. If you go back and find climates that, on the average, were three or four degrees warmer than we were, you know that there, was, there were huge changes on Earth. So that's another way to get at it. But I'm trying to get at it from weather patterns. Um, why aren't we responding here? Well, OK. OK, okay so I like this quote from uh, Woody Allen's my address to the graduates. Today we are at a crossroad. One road leads to hopelessness and despair, the other to total extinction. Let us pray we choose widely, <laughs> wisely. Uh, actually, that was uh, quoted by Sherry Bollert, who was a long time a Republican, interestingly enough, from New York in the House. He was chair of the House Science Committee uh, and a really good guy. I was fortunate to meet him several times and uh, testify in some of his committees. It's uh, a really uh, a great guy. He retired recently. Um, so a <clears throat> uh, summary of my talk is that cl uh, uh, climate, and you know much of this already, so you're just going to get my perspective of it, but the climate change is real and serious. But I'd like to also point out that there are serious issues facing society uh, that are not just about climate and certainly not just mean temperatures. And there are other human impacts on Earth and its life support system, the very direct effects right now that uh, we don't, we're not going to have to wait uh, 50 years to, to, to uh, have uh, threats to the life support system. There are direct effects right now, extinction of species, and there's increasing societal vulnerability to weather and other threats. So that even if uh, climate change were not changing, uh, the uh, uh, carrying capacity of uh, Earth's life support system uh, is under uh, severe threat. Uh, getting back to climate, though, the impacts go far beyond a few degrees of temperature increase. It's the weather, stupid. And so there's no really, uh, I try not to make a distinction between weather and climate because they're all really parts of the same system. Climate is really just the integral uh, of weather over time. And uh, threads throughout uh, this talk, you will see, and you already know probably, that the science is not finished, and that we need our university researchers uh, and the research in the national lab uh, at least as much as we ever did. So that's another point. So <clears throat> this is the part that I, I showed last night. Uh, the prologue is uh, Hurricane Sandy which you've all probably heard about. And this is a uh, photographic essay just to get you in the mood for the importance of severe weather in case you're not in the mood for the importance of severe weather. And uh, when I saw this for the first time, this uh, essay, which was primarily done by my friend Mel Shapiro uh, at NCAR, um, I was really impressed. And I saw a dimension to Hurricane Sandy that I just couldn't get from snippets on the news or uh, the news magazines. So I'm just going to go through this. Uh, these slides are two seconds apart. I'm not going to say a word. We'll just go through them and, uh, and it'll show you, I hope, a, uh, 
an indication of the uh, devastation and the impact on humans that this incredible storm uh, had. And then we'll talk uh, more or less the rest of the talk, keep coming back to whether this was part of climate change or not, and if so, how much? And that's a very hard question to answer. So I'm not gonna say yes or no, as you can imagine, being a cautious, objective scientist, we are rarely uh, ever, do we ever say definitively anything. Um, so here we go. Okay, are you in the mood for importance of weather? And the uh, next week, uh, Bloomberg Business Week, uh, this is the same Michael Bloomberg, who's the mayor of New York City, it's part of his vast empire, um, said it's very simple, simple, it's global warming, stupid. But my question is, as a, always a cautious scientist, uh, is it really global warming's fault? So just a few facts about Hurricane Sandy. Um, had other names, Superstorm Sandy, Frankenstorm, because it occurred around Halloween. It formed in the Western Caribbean on October 22nd, made landfall uh, seven days later on October 30th, Halloween's Eve. It was the largest Atlantic hurricane on record, largest being the largest in terms of size, horizontal diameter, not in terms of intensity of wind speeds. It was barely a category one hurricane when it made landfall, but it was huge, and it generated a huge amount of storm surge. Uh, 53 people were killed in the U.S., and um, I'll come back to that in just a second, and at least 32 billion in damage, which is about, it's a good piece, about one-third of the sequester, which is causing so much uh, uh, publicity and so many problems. And <clears throat> I just want to say, well, how good, you might ask, how good were the forecasts? And they were superb. They were excellent. I kind of focused on that uh, last night, and I'm not going to do so much of that today. But the question is, though, really, how many more lives would have been lost without the good forecast? And I say probably thousands, maybe tens of thousands. Um, the uh, forecasts were excellent. Uh, many people evacuated, many people made preparations. You saw those slides and the devastation that occurred and the fires and so forth. The people hadn't been warned. If uh, there had not been any warnings, who would be expecting a hurricane to come in from the Atlantic from the east in late October? 
It had never happened before. So the, uh, uh, I think the human life toll would have been incredible without these warnings. And so I gave um, a lot of people pats on the back uh, for, that, for that achievement, for this achievement, and um, primarily the, uh, the weather services around the world, the uh, governments for investing in uh, scientific research, in computer models, and in satellite observing systems, uh, the entire weather infrastructure uh, that uh, is expensive, but uh, it's, uh, it does pay off. And I think that this is one case where probably uh, thousands, maybe tens of thousands of lives, we still have people living today that would not be here had this come in uh, 30 to 40 years ago without the uh, satellites and the computer models and the science that's been done over all these years. So this is an important field and we are making progress and we are having a positive impact on, on people's lives. So uh, never before had a hurricane approached the East Coast from the East in late October. This kind of already gives you a clue that something is amiss in terms of the climate. If this has never happened before in the, in the past climate, uh, and now it suddenly happens, well, that's an indication that we might possibly uh, be in some kind of uh, unprecedented climate. Not proof, of course, but it is an indication the first time ever. And here's a, a picture of the, um, let's see, is this thing, yeah. Here's a, uh, a, a map of the uh, track of, of Hurricane Sandy. This is uh, Virginia down here. This is, the, uh, this is Pennsylvania, uh, New Jersey and New York, uh, Connecticut along the coast here. And here's the track of Sandy. It came up from the, uh, from the uh, southwest and then made this turn into the coast of New Jersey before dissipating over uh, Pennsylvania, uh, producing, by the way, uh, significant snowfalls uh, in the Appalachians because it was so late in the season. Well, here's the track of all tropical cyclones ranked category two through five that passed within 200 nautical miles of New York City going back to 1851. And you can see that all of these tracks uh, are very similar and they, uh, regardless of the season, and they pass pretty much from southwest to northeast. So a storm out here, this far off the coast of North Carolina, uh, would, without science and models, would never be expected uh, to do anything more than just move harmlessly off in this direction toward the northeast. Yet it made this turn, um, unprecedented turn to the, uh, to the east, uh, to the west rather. So the forecasts were good. Uh, on the left is the uh, European Center for Meeting Range weather forecast outlook for uh, probability of uh, damaging wind storms. This was nine and a half to get days before landfall or two and a half to get days before Sandy even formed. And then here are the, uh, a number of forecasts in the ECMWF ensemble uh, made six and a half days before landfall and you can see that while there are a few outliers that turn the storm away most of the model runs do carry that storm into this uh, into this area of the uh, northeastern United States so a very good forecast and uh, emergency managers and the official weather forecast and warnings were warning about this storm already a week in advance so what about weather in a warmer climate or hurricanes in a warmer climate? Well, one of the key points is that global warming is not uniform. When the uh, IPCC says that the uh, temperatures globally will rise three degrees over the next 50 years or whatever number they use, that's a global average. Uh, and one important uh, uh, part of this is that the, uh, the global warming is not going to occur in just a uniform rise of temperature. There are going to be some places that are much greater than the average, and other places which are much below the average. And so this differential warming and cooling produces changes in the uh, jet stream and the general circulation. And these produce huge changes in where the rain falls, where it doesn't fall, storm tracks, uh, and so forth. It makes big changes, in short, in the weather. 
Um, so, so we, uh, uh, we, th we think, we know that uh, there will be increased warming over the continents compared to the oceans and polar regions compared to the tropics. Those are two big regional differences that will uh, change the uh, general circulation, uh, jet streams and, small and storm tracks. But also, warmer air can hold much more water vapor. Remember the clausius clapeyron equation for you uh, thermodynamic uh, people in the audience. For every one degree Celsius rise, the atmosphere can hold 7% more water vapor at saturation. So a one degree rise may not seem like much, but that's 7% more water in the air at, that, at, that, at saturation at that temperature, which means every other thing being equal, which of course they never are, but if uh, every storm uh, would have 7% more uh, precipitation uh, with a uh, mean temperature rise of one degree. Three degrees, it would be seven plus seven plus seven, 20, 21 percent more precipitation. Huge amounts, very nonlinear, uh, and so that's an important factor. And uh, thus, the intensity of the hydrologic cycle is increasing. Um, but um, before getting into these regional changes, I want to show, try something out on you. Uh, probably won't work very well. I've tried it with other people, but. I took on the challenge to, to say, uh, to ask myself, what if I had 10 minutes uh, waiting for a bus somewhere or waiting for the dinner to be served uh, to a, a reasonably intelligent person uh, who was somewhat skeptical but still had an open mind about global warming? What would I do with 10 minutes and only three slides? Okay, this is a non-meteorologist, it's a non-physicist. I gotta, I gotta get the, this the elevator speech, a long elevator. Uh, but uh, it's, it's still 10 minutes and three slides. So here's my attempt. Here's the three slides I picked. The first slide is a correlation and observations. It shows that global mean temperatures and carbon dioxide are rising together since 1860. This graph goes back to 1860. It goes out to 2010. Temperature is, uh, scale is over here. These are departures from a, a baseline. So minus 0.6 down here and plus 0.6 up here. Uh, blue is below the baseline and red is above the baseline. And with a lot of variability here, you can see uh, the temperatures are rising, especially uh, since, 19, um, since 1970. And more smoothly, carbon dioxide is, is also rising. First of all, slowly during the period and then suddenly accelerating uh, about the time you see all the red occurring. So several points from this, and, I got, and I'm running out of my 10 minutes, but uh, the, uh, uh, the temperatures are rising, the carbon dioxide is rising, circumstantial evidence to be sure, but also that there's a lot of variability in the temperatures, more variability in the temperatures than there is in the, in the carbon dioxide rise. You see some periods here where for over uh, 20 years, the te mean temperatures actually went down, and some periods in here where the mean temperatures were pretty steady for 10 years, which, by the way, this is not part of my 10 minutes. As you all know, the last decade, there's been no significant mean global temperature rise, and I think that's getting to be a serious problem, communications problem, for us that, uh, you know, this warming here uh, has actually leveled off and uh, if we, uh, the skeptics or the deniers are going out and saying, well, see, there's nothing to it. But you can look back in this record and you can see that there are many 10-year periods where there wasn't much warming. Other th things are going on. Aerosols are increasing. The solar, uh, solar effects are, are, uh, are variable and we had a, we've had a weak solar maximum so far. But uh, some people say that the heat now is going into the oceans rather than the atmosphere. There's all kinds of kind of uh, excuses, but still, if the temperatures don't start rising in the next decade again, I think uh, we're going to have a harder trouble, a harder time than ever talking about global warming. But that's an aside. So that's slide one. Slide two is a completely different set of observations. Nothing to do with CO2, nothing to do with temperature measurements, which are always suspect. This is global average sea level is rising from two causes, expansion of water due to warming and melting of the glaciers. These are, again, entirely independent observations, and they show a very steady uh, increase in sea level, 
rise uh, from 19, uh, this is from 1992 to uh, 2011. So again, a completely different set of uh, data that are entirely consistent with uh, global warming. And by the way, the global sea level rise is a great integrator. It doesn't, it's not Chicago or uh, Europe or where Russia or someplace, it's the whole world. And so it integrates all of the effects of uh, increasing ocean temperature and uh, melting ice everywhere uh, on land. So then the uh, third slide tries to get at, at why humans, why we think humans are causing this, and, and also gets at the models are pretty damn good. So here's a, um, another map of the global temperature anomalies from 1890 to 1990, 1890 to, to, to uh, excuse me, uh, to year 2000. And again, a lot of variability with the uh, warm period in the middle here, then kind of cooling, uh, our steady temperatures, and then a rapid rise at the end of this period. So those are observations. Here's um, what climate models do if you only include in the models volcanic activity and solar activity. You don't include, you hold the greenhouse gases constant. And they show actually a pretty good uh, replication of the, of the observations through about 1950, and then they completely miss this period of rapid, rapid war uh, warming, which tells you that the models are either no good or that they're missing something. And if you run the models, exactly the same models, with the observed carbon dioxide, methane, and other greenhouse gases, you get uh, climate model simulation, which is extremely close uh, to, the, uh, to the observation. So this shows that you need, uh, the models are pretty good if you include all of the known effects of uh, volcanoes, solar effects, and greenhouse gases. Also this includes sulfate and sulfate aerosols and ozone. Uh, if you in include the chemistry of the atmosphere uh, as well as the uh, volcanoes uh, and solar, you get a pretty darn good replication of the climate. So those are my three slides, and um, I tried this out on some, I thought were intelligent people, and uh, in our office, people who weren't scientists, and uh, I, I kind of just gave up when, when one of them told me, uh, sounds good, but I don't understand how to read a graph. <laughs> so, uh, and, you know, I thought that everybody knew how to read a graph, right? You got time going one way and something else going the other way. And uh, they, uh, at least one person uh, who I thought was really pretty, pretty bright person, honestly didn't know how to read a graph and how to interpret. So we've got some issue, problems to, uh, ahead of us with education, not just at the university level. Okay, um, back to, I'm off the three slides 10 minutes now, uh, but uh, getting back to global warming is not uniform. Well, here's a chart of that. It shows the observed uh, changes in surface temperature over different decades. This is the 70s, 80s, 90s, and 2000s. You can see that uh, temperatures have been warming globally uh, on the uh, average over this period, but in each decade the warming is uh, occurring uh, in different regions. So here is the, uh, this is the total warming at the end of this, this period. And you can see that most of the warming is over the uh, uh, north, northern latitudes, a lot of warming over uh, um, uh, Europe and Asia, uh, Africa. Uh, there's more warming in general over the continents than over the oceans. So this kind of spotty pattern is changing the general circulation. Number one, it's slowing down the jet stream. If, there's, if the uh, polar regions get uh, warmer and the tropics don't, change, don't warm as much, the north-south temperature, the polar temperature difference is, is weaker, and the westerlies are going to be weaker. And if you completely, you know, went to a super uh, greenhouse gas atmosphere, you wouldn't have any temperature difference between the pole and the equator, and you'd have no west winds, no, no uh, jet streams at all. So I personally think this is leading to uh, possibly a slowing down of the jet stream. Well, we know that because there are some measurements of that. Uh, has to be almost, uh, not almost, it has to be, but because the mean westerlies are slowing down, blocking patterns are going to be more frequent. Um, 
which means, uh, and of course, blocking patterns are uh, very important in producing flooding regions and very drought and drought regions. So, global warming is not uniform, and here are the observations that prove that. They're pretty good. They're pretty close to what the the models say. The models, of course, have predicted the greater warming in the Arctic and Antarctic for many, uh, for, uh, for almost ever, since there were climate models, and also more warming over land than over oceans because of the uh, slowness of the oceans to respond. Well, global warming is not about, about the future. There are some impacts that are already occurring, and I, I don't have to tell you about the first bullet, but ice is melting worldwide. Rising sea level already showed you. We're approaching an ice-free Arctic, which I consider fascinating. I never thought that would happen in my lifetime. In fact, when I told students at, at Penn State that the Arctic was eventually going to become ice-free, I, I told them it would never happen in my lifetime. I think it actually could now if I live long enough. Um, there are, is a greater frequency of droughts and floods. The hydrologic cycle is on steroids. Uh, there are more forest fires, uh, changes in storm tracks, and there are changes in hurricane frequency and intensity. I'll come back to that in, in Hurricane Sandy in a bit. But increasing forest fires, uh, I'll just show you an interesting uh, anecdote or a forest fire, grass fire in Australia. Uh, not that it proves that forest fires are increasing, but it's just a neat video. And, um, and I'm not saying that this is how the climate's going to be 50 years from now, where this will be happening in central Ohio. If the darn thing plays. Okay, this was an amazing photography taken by a, uh, a man, Chris Tangy, from Alice Springs Film and Televi Television. So mammoth grass fire, which is producing um, dry convection uh, from the, uh, the heat generated by the fires, and that convection is spinning up tornadoes or, or dust devils or fire devils, which uh, are carrying the flames from the grass fire up into the uh, funnel. And this happens all the time in, uh, in terms of uh, tornadic-like vortices with, with forest fires, but rarely do the, are the flames visible like this. So that's not exactly a uh, pleasant uh, picture of climate, future climate, right? My computer is bogged down here for some reason. Okay, well, you're probably all very familiar with this. This, this could have gone in as my third and a half slide, is that uh, uh, Greenland mass loss, you, you can get at uh, uh, melting ice uh, in, in a number of ways, and one of the fascinating ways is you can determine the loss of mass just by simply measuring gravity changes. And when I was, you mentioned I was the uh, father of MM5, which is, which is actually true, uh, that I used to think that gravity was the most boring thing in the in the world. It was what 9.8, 9.81, and you put it in the model, and that was the one thing you knew was was right in the model. Uh, and so, uh, but actually, uh, as I, as I matured a little bit, uh, and found the fascinating thing that two satellites can do flying in tandem, and measuring the differential acceleration between the satellites, they are, they are, are picking up the variations in gravity, um, which is uh, uh, extremely important. And you can uh, then detect the uh, loss of mass of uh, ice, massive amounts of ice over, uh, over Greenland. And these can be uh, correlated with other estimates of measuring and, and, and completely independent and get essentially the same answer. So scientists know a lot about global warming, I've shown you some of the irrefutable evidence, not only just temperatures, which are maybe always suspect because they're thermometers, or t ob temperatures from space, but also sea level, sea level rise, melting ice, and loss of uh, uh, large amounts of uh, mass from, the, uh, uh, from Greenland. And then there is the, the big July 2012 meltdown where 90% uh, of the surface ice uh, uh, melted 
uh, for about uh, four days. Uh, we'd never seen that before either. And here's just a graph showing the, I'm not going to spend too much time on ice because uh, this is, you'll probably find big mistakes uh, being, the, being the expert. So, uh, but, uh, but people who don't, uh, play places that don't specialize in ice, uh, find this, this kind of thing uh, amazing, kind of, kind of thing fascinating that you can get so much out of climate just by looking at uh, changes of ice. Of course, this is very recent climate. So what is causing the warming um, and basically the, its emissions of carbon dioxide pollution, I'm not going to spend much time on this because you all know it, but it just reminds you. Uh, this graph is, is, is interesting. It's a um, uh, graph of the world primary energy supply going back to 1800, and it shows the types of energy. The units, by the way, are exajoules per year, and here's 100 and 200 and 300 and 400. Just for comparison, the U.S. Uh, consumes about 95 exajoules per year, so U.S. consumption is about here. The uh, tsunami in Japan uh, in 2011 was about one, between one and two uh, exajoules, uh, so that was way down in here. So here are the different kinds of, uh, of uh, energy uh, natural gas is the yellow, oil is this gray, um, coal, a nuclear, and uh, what's the blue? Hydro plus, which means uh, hydro plus wind plus solar, renewables other than biomass, and then biomass is down here, biomass burning. So uh, big increase in uh, fuel energy use, uh, beginning uh, the big rapid up to uptick here was being, uh, in the 1950s. And again, that's uh, with some lag is fairly well correlated with the uh, uh, increase in global temperature rise. So we know that, and those are the fossil fuels. Um, wanted to show you another interesting graph that I, I found that if you look back to, our, to uh, 1900, and you look at uh, disasters um, that uh, the people affected by disasters and ec economic impacts, uh, they've been growing, but the amaz uh, amazing point is that human deaths have been decreasing in spite of the population growing very rapidly during this period. So here's 1900, uh, always, now it's worrying me, worrying me to show graphs uh, for some reason, but uh, it shows that here, you know, with, with some noise, especially early in the period, the number of deaths, this is 500,000 uh, number of people killed by uh, natural disasters, has been decreasing steeply. We're now well under 100,000 per year, in spite of a rapid increase in the number of disasters reported and a rapid increase in the number of people affected. So in spite of more people more people affected and more disasters. Um, the number of people that have uh, died, have been killed by these disasters, uh, has gone steeply down. And I think this is, uh, since most of these disasters are weather related, they are uh, due to uh, increased uh, forecasting and warning uh, systems, and to some extent, uh, more resilient uh, structures. And uh, however, damage, uh, economic damage, caused by uh, reported natural disasters is on a very steep increase with a very with a rapid uh, variability. This is uh, 300 billion dollars uh, per year is what up here. This is zero 1900 to uh, 2010 and there's you see that a huge uh, there's just very little reported or calculated uh, prior to uh, 1970 when, when the uh, increase became very steep and a very large variability from year to year. So what counts for the uh, rises in the disasters and the economic impacts? Well, you actually you find climate change pretty far down on this list. Uh, it's a factor, but it's not the only factor. More people, we're now up to, what is it, over seven billion people worldwide. Um, uh, but this is an important point. This was important in Sandy. They built all these uh, developments right along the beach destroyed the wetlands, the ecosystems, there was no buffer, and so the, uh, many ecosystems are so frayed that they no longer pay a, play a natural cushioning role. People are migrating to more 
disaster-prone coastal areas, um, and uh, soon more than half the world's people will be living in, in cities, in other words, in very concentrated areas, such as New York City, uh, New Orleans, Miami, uh, places that are uh, very susceptible. And then I would argue that climate change, global warming, is playing a role as well. And you should never forget this, the uh, fundamental driver is the uh, increasing population. If we had uh, a million people on the earth, it wouldn't make any difference. None of this would, make, well, none of this would be happening. But we, as we go to past six billion, go to seven billion, uh, the cumulative activities of all these people, uh, destruction of habitat, uh, burning fossil fuels, just go down the list. Overfishing uh, is, is creating this, uh, this uh, stress on the on Earth system. And so why are human deaths decreasing? I've already suggested that that's better forecasts and warnings and better building codes in some countries, in countries which don't have the building codes or the wherewithal to produce the uh, structures that can withstand mod moderate storms and winds, uh, the deaths are still uh, very high. So um, we know a lot about climate change. I've shown you some of the things we do know about, but there's a lot of uncertainty in future climate projections, especially at the, uh, at the regional level. I mentioned one thing already that we don't really understand, I don't think we understand it, is uh, why the temperatures have stopped rising in the last 10 years. Uh, that needs to be explained, and I think that's a surprise with uh, still the rapid growth in uh, greenhouse gases and still the uh, temperatures have slowed down. Um, but there are significant uncertainties and tropical cyclones are one example. This is why we still need science. The, uh, we don't know everything we need to know. So I hope there's a future for us scientists and for you students who want to be scientists. Uh, I think there should be. Uh, it's never been, uh, never been more important a uh, topic, um, geosciences uh, in general. So here's a... Uh, this is kind of a complicated thing. I'm not going to spend much time on it, but I just want to show you some of the uncertainties in present climate models. This is a recent paper by Clara Desser, uh, D-E-S-E-R, at, at NCAR, if you want to look up the references. But uh, she looked at the temperature changes, and this happens to be a 55-year uh, um, average of, from many models, temperature changes in different models uh, from... Uh, I think it's about 40 models. And this is the average June, July, August over the US. So most of the warming over the, uh, the western US uh, and less in the uh, uh, north and south. But here's the um, uh, warmest uh, of the models. They're predicting a much higher temperature change. And that, those numbers are up to four to five degrees Celsius. These are summertime temperatures. How would you like Columbus's temperature to be four degrees Celsius warmer in June, July, and August? No, you wouldn't want that, right? That's not, just, that's not a few degrees. This is big stuff. Uh, huge, this would put, put a huge, have a, just a gigantic impact. Then here's the coolest of the models. And it's down in the range of you know, less than two degrees over, over, the, uh, over Ohio, for example, and over most of the US. So a huge difference. And you might think that e either of these is equally probable, and this is maybe the most probable. But the most probable is about two to three degrees, which is uh, still, still significant. So, but a lot, lot of uncertainty, right? The, the warmest set of models predicts almost a catastrophic change in 50 years. The coolest, you know, important, but not, not that important. And then the, the average is, uh, is, is, is important, but obviously between the extremes. If you look at precipitation, you get even a uh, uh, greater variability in the models on a regional basis. Uh, the average of 40 models, um, okay, uh, browns are drier, blues are wetter, so the average of the models, 40 models, a lot, most of the drying is in the west and the south. A little bit up here through the green, green belt, but then uh, wetter, over most, more, most of Canada and the northern US. If you look at the wettest models, the um, precipitation uh, is predicted to be over 40% more in uh, whatever that state is. I hope it's not Colorado. 
Uh, sorry. Uh, and uh, th then the driest show a complete change uh, from, from extremely uh, wetter to extremely drier, and uh, the average being something uh, kind of in between. So basically, it's hard to uh, plan for uh, precipitation uh, for these uh, rather two extremes. Uh, and, and we don't know uh, which uh, of these uh, scenarios is most likely. We, we think probably the average is, is the best bet, but there are these uh, signi significant number of models that produce a very wet forecast and very dry forecast in the climate change. Let's get back uh, to um, um, hurricanes and kind of begin to finish up here. Uh, storms like Katrina and Sandy lead us to ask, are hurricanes changing with, a global, with global warming? And you might think, uh, I, I did my early research on hurricanes, that it would be a no-brainer. You would say unequivocally, yes, they had to, because hurricanes are known to be forming only over water temperatures over uh, 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and uh, they require large amounts of water vapor in the atmosphere. So the air is getting warmer. Clashes Clapeyron tells us 7% increase in water vapor for every one degree increase in temperature. Ocean temperatures are getting warmer. That should be a no-brainer. Storms should getting, be getting more frequent uh, and more intense. Uh, but it's not quite that simple. Uh, <clears throat> the the um, model results for the changes in hurricane characteristics are actually ambiguous. Some evidence that uh, hurricane frequency may actually decrease globally but the intensity will increase. So fewer hurricanes, perhaps, but the ones that do form will be more intense. What do you do with that? And then there's uh, also large variation from ocean basin to ocean basin, which is not surprising if the, if the weather patterns are changing and the uh, warming is not uniform, you would expect that some ocean basins would behave differently than others. And so, um, Observationally, there appears to be an increase in intensity of hurricanes, but not frequency over the past 30 years, which uh, does support the, uh, uh, the model results. But I would say these are uh, quite uncertain results, and it's another scientific question that needs uh, further study. Here are some GFDL, NOAA GFDL results that uh, from idealized uh, hurricane simulations in different models. The, um, um, what we see here is more graphs. Uh, the number of occurrences, this is over many, uh, uh, over, over many years, so this is 20, 40, 60, 80. And the minimum central pressure, which is a proxy for intensity, you see in, this, in these model runs, which included, um, uh, let's say, nine GCMs, three ocean basins, four different physics parameterizations, uh, the average of all of these was um, Fewer storms, are, uh, but more intense. So the peak in this distribution was at a, a significantly lower pressure uh, in the peak in, under the present con the control conditions with, uh, with the present CO2 concentrations. So in today's CO2, we've got this distribution in the models. Uh, more storms out here, uh, more weaker storms, uh, but uh, in the changed CO2, fewer weaker storms, but more intense ones. So the distribution uh, has changed. It's probably not a good thing overall, because it's the really damage, it's the really big storms that uh, cause most of the impact and the damage. What's going on in the, uh, in the observations? Well, this is some observations from the North Atlantic, and it goes back to 1860. And in the North Atlantic, I guess you can say there's been a increase since 1860 in the number of all tropical storms. But it's not, it's not overwhelmingly convincing, is it? Uh, there's a period here for many years, 40 years, where the frequency went down, then it went up, and then it was steady, and now it's suddenly going up a little bit. Uh, generally a very weak increase. All hurricanes, a uh, lot of variability uh, on decadal time scales, in major hurricanes even, um, maybe a slight increase, but it's not, it's not the kind of thing that you say, well, here is clearly a climate signature in the, in the number of, of hurricanes. So again, a major uh, scientific uh, 
question. So back to uh, Hurricane Sandy and climate change. Well, we know that the Atlantic Ocean temperatures were unusually high, three degrees Celsius above average. So that's probably something you can pin on, at least partly on climate change. Sea level rise had increased over the past 50 years. And so that's almost certainly due to um, climate change. And that's increased the impact of the storm surge. And so that, I think, we can pin on climate change. And then a highly speculative bullet, the unusual blocking pattern may be related to the record loss of Arctic sea ice in 2012. This is, uh, there's been some papers and speculation related on that. Why Hurricane Sandy did that left hook and moved in from the east is that there's a huge blocking high pressure, warm high pressure area over Greenland. And the circulation around Greenland, that high uh, easterly winds, uh, steered Sandy into the coast. And that blocking pattern, the intensity of that block was extremely unusual and some people have related it to the, uh, possibly to the record loss of Arctic sea ice in 2012. So you see uh, all kinds of uh, interesting interactions going on here on a regional scale. Loss of Arctic ice somehow in, in, uh, in September in the, in the Arctic somehow leads to circulation changes, more blocks. This block forms in late October over Greenland, stays there, is unusually strong, forces the storm to the east. The storm is stronger than usual because sea surface temperatures are three degrees higher. You know, this is what I would argue in court if I was saying this is global warming's fault. The Huffington Post puts it this way, if this were a criminal case, detectives would be treating global warming as a likely accomplice in the crime. Um, so I'm not going to read all this to you. This is the, what the IPCC, IPCC said uh, in 2007, the fourth assessment report. It's more likely than not that there is a human contribution to the observed trend of hurricane intensification. Uh, note that they said intensification, not number, since 1970. Uh, in the future, it's likely, which means better than two to one odds, that future tropical cyclones will become more intense with more heavy precipitation. So that's the official word as of, as of today. But um, I'd like to uh, pretty much close here with the, uh, this analogy of odds versus cause and effect of a signal storm. And this is where, as scientists, we always get nervous when there's a single event and people ask us, is this because of climate change? So my thought experiment is <clears throat> have a deck of cards. You replace a non-ace card with an ace. You still have 52 cards, but now you have five aces instead of four. The odds of drawing an ace go from, in one draw, go from four over 52 to five over 52 which is a 25% increase. That's a big increase, right, percentage-wise. But the odds of drawing an ace are still small. Now 9.6% in any one draw versus 7.7%. And it's impossible to identify a single ace drawn with the one you added. So you can't say whether that ace was there at the beginning or it's the one you added because of climate change. Uh, and only with many draws will you find out the anomaly with confidence. You're not gonna, I'm not gonna, you're not gonna tell me which is the different deck by one draw. But if you do 100 draws, or certainly 1,000 draws, you're gonna know with certainty. So maybe that's not very satisfying <clears throat> um, when they ask you, uh, was Hurricane Sandy caused by global change? <clears throat> uh, because of, of this uh, odds versus cause and effect of a single storm. Well, back to Sherry Bollert. Um, he made this quote in 2006, which is already seven years ago. Uh, right now, those of us who seek action, and he meant action on climate change, hard to believe a Republican, prominent Republican, would be calling for climate change. Um, all who seek action are confronted by ideology, by fear, by a reluctance to lead, by apathy, by comfort with the status quo. Uh, which one of those applies to you? 
Um, maybe, uh, well, I better not, better not go there. <laughs> All of this has to change, and I think it is beginning to change. Well, it didn't get any better in seven years. Uh, it's probably worse, if anything. And so I just leave you with no answers. Uh, but uh, I, I ask, who do we look for leadership? And here are some, some likely suspects. Um, I think that there are some strange uh, <clears throat> possibilities here. Uh, for example, uh, religion is a, uh, is a potential uh, le uh, leader in uh, climate change because of the idea that um, some people believe God wanted us to be stewards of Earth uh, and not destroying it. And that is actually does have some traction in, in some religious quarters. Um, academia, uh, for sure, academia tends to be more rational than the rest of the world, but I say tends to be <laughs> because uh, we, none of us, none of us uh, are completely rational when uh, it gets too near to our own uh, dearly held uh, beliefs or prejudices. But still, academia as a whole is really, I think, one of our major hopes here. Uh, that's where much of the science is done. That's where much, much of the healthy questioning uh, is going on. And, and I think academia has to be a big, play a big role. And the others, I think uh, we gotta, everybody has a role in this. Um, and so with that, uh, thanks very much. Appreciate your attention.